Well, uh, guys, thanks so much for making this session. I'm super excited to go into greater technical detail uh, about what we're doing with uh, uh, Streamliner, Apache Spark, and how that's being uh, funneled into predictive analytics uh, with real-world applications. Um, we can kick off, I think, at a high level about what is uh, uh, predictive and uh, the difference between descriptive and predictive analytics. And then we're actually going to go through an actual tutorial on how to build an application um, using all of these pieces together. Let me see if I can get this mic working really quick. Let me go from there. There we go. So let's start off with what the difference is between descriptive and predictive analytics. Uh, descriptive analytics is quite literally describing what's happened. Um, it's based on the notion of stash data or data that has been accumulating and collected and is now going to be analyzed in a offline context. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of the uh, uh, core part of any batch analytics infrastructure and it is definitely fine for certain parts of the business but what we're seeing uh, with in-memory processing is a inability to map that to uh, new use cases and new workloads, which uh, is now pushing us to look at uh, how real-time data is actually able to affect uh, new use cases within the enterprise. Um, if we look at uh, what real-time data can do, um, it can basically give you the ability to use real-time data in an online context. Now, I believe that predictive analytics can be more useful if you do have access to live data. And fundamentally, if you can couple uh, that live data uh, with an online system and you're doing a bi-directional feedback loop. Um, fundamentally, live data uh, into your business gives you a closer relationship with your customers. Um, it enables you to create a personalized experience, certainly for every customer, because you are literally seeing what they're doing in the moment and monitoring and uh, returning an optimized recommendation, a personalized response, um, changing uh, conditions in the market. Uh, this is giving you an ability to really uh, customize your business to each customer that you have. If we shift over to what we believe about what predictive analytics is all about, it really is main memory oriented. Meaning that if you look at your systems today and if they are primarily disk based, those systems are not able to sustain the uh, write throughput or the scan uh, load that is necessary to move in real time with your business. Remember, we're not doing this just for a handful of users, you're doing this for every user that you have. Uh, this could potentially be millions of users, and customers like Pinterest uh, are doing this for all of their, uh, of their individual users uh, using MemSQL in certain contexts. Uh, I wanted to list a few technologies that I think you guys should be really looking at uh, in earnest. Uh, with Kafka being the first sort of the, uh, the message bus, uh, we see this in so many different accounts, and it really is going to be a mainstream uh, need across the enterprise. Next, of course, is Spark. Uh, you know, Doug Cutting mentioned that up on stage a little earlier. We're closely integrating with it. It really is capturing the zeitgeist of what's happening with main memory processing. And the difference between uh, Spark and an in-memory database uh, is quite different, but also complementary. Uh, Spark is an execution engine. It's a programming environment for ad hoc custom queries that you want to run in Scala or Python. And we're going to do that a little later. Um, but there's no way to store the state of that model. There's no way to store that data uh, uh, consistently. So an in-memory database that can capture the uh, process uh, from Spark is critical. And what we'll show you a little uh, later is how you can actually leverage both uh, an in-memory database and Spark to really, really uh, create a bi-directional uh, feedback loop, um, as well as save the data consistently. Um, <clears throat> I think the bi-directional aspect is so critical. I, I was on stage a little earlier really thinking about how data scientists, we need to be thinking about going from the back office to the front office. Real-time data access can take us from the back office to the front office. Um, if our models are being leveraged by front-end or uh, in-process uh, applications, that means we're actually changing the business for the better and we're optimizing it in a meaningful way. Um, so I think it makes a lot of sense uh, to, uh, to get the model online. Um, if you're looking at archive data or stale data, you're separated from the revenue. You're separated from the customer set. So this is something that I think when we start thinking about predictive analytics, uh, main memory processing is critical, but also the ability to access live data. And that is what I think is just so important for data scientists to contend with, is moving beyond batch and looking at real-time streams, for example. So we can talk about what we're doing today with MemSQL 5. That launched this morning. I'm super excited about it because it contains a lot of new features and functions that are designed for uh, predictive analytics. Uh, the engineering team uh, has been hard at work for the last year delivering this release. They put in more than 150 lines of code into this uh, system. Uh, it is 10 times faster than the last version. Um, and it has native integration with Kafka and Spark using an open source uh, application that is now uh, uh, on GitHub called Streamliner. And of course, uh, a new logo too. 
I couldn't resist adding that in there uh, for what we're doing, but I really believe it reflects um, all of the uh, maturation and uh, excitement that we've done uh, to bring uh, MemSQL 5 uh, to release today. Um, <clears throat> We can talk a little bit more in depth uh, about what we're doing with uh, this code generation. Um, one of the things that uh, you'll find with main memory processing is that as soon as you remove disk from the equation, meaning that you are no longer bottlenecked on I.O., you only have two remaining uh, choke points or bottlenecks to contend with. Uh, the first is network, uh, which is a physics problem. Uh, if your network is too slow, the only solution is to get a better network, uh, uh, faster as it were. Uh, and then the second bottleneck is CPU. So if you can actually design in your uh, infrastructure CPU-bounded applications, you're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, and we see it from the same perspective at a database level, uh, where code generation is designed uh, to bypass interpretation along a hot code path. Um, this is something that is incredibly uh, uh, sort of uh, wonky, but what you'll find with code generation is an ability to really optimize uh, the query so that you can feed that data back into the model all the much faster. Um, in terms of what we shifted to, we used to use GCC. Uh, at some point, you could actually literally inspect the C++ code that was being generated per query. Uh, but with this new system, we actually moved over to LLVM. Um, and that gave us this 10x improvement on how quickly we can actually run queries here. Um, if we shift over to what Streamliner can do, Streamliner is uh, built on top of Apache Spark. Uh, it uses uh, uh, S S uh, Apache Streaming, uh, Spark Streaming, I should say, to uh, effectively give you really transformative ETL in a live context, meaning that you are doing the transformation live as this is current, as it's happening, and this is all predicated because uh, Apache Spark is actually shipping with the MemSQL uh, uh, Community Edition and Enterprise Edition today. Um, one click uh, deployment of Spark and you have now co-located the Spark process and the MemSQL process on the same machines. And it's giving you the ability, again, to have an interactive exploration environment with Spark, as well as a declarative analytics environment with an in-memory database like MemSQL. Um, <clears throat> one of the exciting things that we'll show you in a moment is how you can actually upload custom uh, logic into the system and transform that data very nicely. Um, it's my belief that IoT and predictive analytics go hand in hand. Um, sensors are only useful if you're reading them, uh, and if you can actually respond to the sensors, all the better. Um, this manifests uh, principally in, in real-time telemetry. Uh, you can think of any sort of uh, sensor device that's emitting data. If you can get access to that, you can actually use it to uh, effectively prevent a catastrophe uh, before it snowballs. Uh, a lot of uh, customers that are concerned uh, with, uh, uh, or rather focused on online business e-commerce, revenue per minute is a key metric that needs to be tracked. And if you see revenue per minute drop, typically it's actually an infrastructure problem. Um, and you don't want to wait until your revenue is dropping on a minute basis if you can find the anomaly before it cascades into something that's really negatively affecting uh, what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> I would also caution, of course, that you need to uh, think about data overload. Uh, we're going to show you a, a quick sort of uh, application and walk through it that's going to be uh, reading and writing upwards of two million times per second to render the analytic. Um, <clears throat> this is certainly something that is now possible in commodity hardware, but uh, the notion of actually having access to all of this data can quickly create overwhelming uh, uh, demand for new access, but also how do you parse and how do you process that? Um, I think the notion of a data lake and collecting everything makes sense because the cost of disk is zero and storage is free. Uh, but it, data is only useful if you can take meaningful action on it. And one of the contexts or the corollaries between a data lake and uh, an IoT or real-time environment is the ability to properly and cleanly synthesize the data so that you're not overwhelmed uh, with terabytes of data on a daily basis. So that brings us to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the next phase of what I want to talk about. We mentioned this on stage a little earlier. MemSQL PowerStream is going to show you how you can leverage all of this together and build real-time applications very quickly. Um, we're going to get real technical, so uh, uh, we're going to jump into sort of how this process was built. But I want to show you that the concept of creating Kafka, Spark, and an in-memory database like MemSQL can be a cohesive solution and not something that needs to be uh, stitched together. So what we'll start off here is just that high level upside uh, or overview of what we're looking at. Um, from what we're doing here, we're going to be uh, able to look at any part of the globe. Um, this is just an overview of what we're doing. Uh, but one of the things that's really cool to note is that geospatial is built into this product. I think when you look at IoT and real-time data, every data point now has a place. There's a lot long associated with anything that's happening on a mobile device. And if you can track that, it's better than not. Um, so this is something that is really neat because you can start aggregating very quickly using this data point. 
Um, in this particular instance, we're going to simulate uh, an earthquake in the Bay Area. Um, this is something that is pretty easy to, uh, to render uh, because everything happens live. Um, in this case, uh, we're just going to basically flip the switch over here. And you're going to start seeing, of course, that we're now seeing Alameda going down, Solano, et cetera. And that's a function that this is live updates, meaning that if you think within your business, if you can touch an anomaly such as this one earlier, you have now created an alerting system that is critical for the online part of the business that you're working in. Um, so this is just something that is starting to show off what is possible with real-time data and the ability to go forward with predictive analytics. Uh, <clears throat> this is running on Azure, as it were, running on just seven nodes. So what's possible with commodity hardware cannot be understated. Uh, the ability for seven machines to run a two million insert a second workload is now possible. And everyone here can actually touch that type of performance for loading data in or processing data as it goes. Um, in terms of what this is rendering, uh, we believe uh, you know, a real-time analytics database should have uh, a real-time analytics response and sort of the monitoring. So here we're just showing off what is possible with uh, the dashboard. So let's go ahead and actually build this PowerStream demo. Uh, what we're going to do is actually deploy Apache Spark with a single line of code. And what we're next going to do is actually start building out these pipelines. Uh, we're going to do something very, very advanced, which is actually merging and joining two discrete pipelines together. And if we can expose that in a familiar interface, a familiar language, which is SQL, it suddenly makes your jobs so much easier so you can expose the data to the rest of the organization. So in this case, what we're going to do next is we're just going to start declaring the details of this pipeline. Next thing is going to start uh, uh, pulling the Kafka URL. In this case, it started up there. So we're just going to highlight that and uh, proceed next. And at that point, it's all about declaring a, a Kafka topic. So now you have now basically connected to the Kafka server, and you're now subscribing to a topic that can be flowing into a in-memory table for ultra-fast access. In this case, though, the most exciting part of this demonstration is how we're actually mon uh, munging and transforming the data using Scala uh, in this particular instance to transform the data points coming in. In this case, we're going to run a custom Scala transformation uh, on the data as it's ingested. And what we'll see next is that we're now going to actually map that uh, topic into a database and a table that is going to uh, allow you to persist the stream of data. Very straightforward here. Now, the concept of actually streaming into a row or column table makes total sense. But in this case, we're actually going to go even one step further. And we're going to ensure that we're going to do deduplication as we actually ingest. So in this particular instance, we're going to find out uh, that we can actually uh, catch a duplicate key. So if you can dedupe and you can transform data and catch it before it goes into the system, you've avoided a lot of heartache about trusting that data set because you know it's already been deduped and it's done live. Next step, we're going to hit save and run the pipeline. Uh, in this case, we're just needing to uh, turn on the script that's going to basically flow Kafka data through the system. In this particular instance, uh, you're going to see that it's pr going pretty fast. I mean, in terms of what's possible with commodity hardware, again, running on a cloud environment, um, you can start seeing that we're going to be pushing uh, a substantial amount of data through the system. Let me go back one. There we go. Okay, so we created one pipeline that's now flowing. We're now going to create a second pipeline called alerts. The batch interval is just set at one second. That typically tends to be the appropriate response uh, per second on it. Um, in this particular instance, we're going to do a wind alerts extractor. So as the data is flowing through, we're going to use uh, Scala to, again, once again, transform and munge that data as it's going through. Similar case, where we actually persist a stream coming from Kafka into a table that you can then pull uh, using a SQL interface. So now we have data flowing through. And we're ready to go next. 
So now it's time to simulate a global apocalypse. This is really going to stress the system. This is, uh, you know, sort of Armageddon, as it were. Um, and in this particular instance, everything is going to start failing. And the key here is that you have uh, an architecture that is able to sustain that type of, of, of uh, spike is really sort of the use case here. If you can see a spike of data and sustain it, that might manifest in a sale or uh, sort of uh, any sort of e-commerce, um, uh, Thanksgiving holiday, Black Friday, that sort of thing. So if we look at sort of how this is built and going into sort of the RDD transformer, um, we're going to actually split the data and we're next. Going, we're actually uh, doing all the transformation here live. So as every uh, uh, data point through Kafka flows through, it's actually hitting this application logic uh, to parse and uh, separate the data into unique uh, values for the database. Uh, we're going to basically run a query to show wind farms outside of normal bounds. Again, this is sort of that alerting system. And again, you can actually start looking at what you can do in real time to catch these anomalies using this type of, of interface. Again, this is just basic Scala in your own IDE environment. Uh, but we have now been able to uh, create a data frame and output an RDD that will be mapped to a table that then makes it so easy for the rest of your business to touch. Not many people can do this, but everyone can run a SQL query for the most part. Analysts, PMs, et cetera. Uh, you don't want your analysts or PMs running uh, uh, their own Scala interfaces. It creates a lot of uh, shift in the environment. So at this point, it becomes a very straightforward approach to basically map that RDD into uh, a MemSQL table. And at that point, we have done a transform up top. Uh, we've mapped everything, and we have an RDD that's ready to, uh, to transition. So at this point, we now can actually add a little bit of statistical logic to make this a little bit more intelligent. And what, this, what you have here is actually the result of that. So with a little bit of custom analytics with a uh, very flexible environment with Spark, you can now persist and uh, scope that data with a very familiar interface and get something like this. Uh, this is just front-end JavaScript. Uh, this is using a, a, a geospatial uh, graphing library called Mapbox. Uh, it's designed to work with SQL, and this is exactly what it will look like with a, a very easy combination and framework environment. So that was actually the underpinnings of what I showed uh, this morning. Uh, at this point, I would love to introduce J.R. Cahill, who's the Senior Solutions Architect at Kellogg. We're going to do a little Q&A. So, uh, J.R., please join me. All righty. So one of the things that I think is really interesting uh, about what's happening with, with big data is how it's actually just not a function of West Coast or East Coast uh, implementations. This is happening across uh, uh, every industry, across CPG, manufacturing, logistics. Uh, and uh, I wanted to actually open up the floor to JR and ask him a few questions about what he is seeing uh, and fundamentally see if that maps to what you guys are actually uh, looking at in your own fields. So uh, JR, would you uh, give a little quick bio about yourself and uh, we can get started. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm the Senior Solutions Architect for uh, Global Analytics at Kellogg, um, which basically means I'm in charge of analytics throughout the entire globe. Um, I've been in data for almost 20 years. Uh, we, right now, Kellogg's are embarking on our journey through analytics, and one of the things that we have started to embark on is our in-memory journey. <clears throat> and that's pretty much where we're going. Cool. I mean, what, what are sort of the, the, the indicators or symptoms that you saw as you were sort of exploring this? Because in-memory is very new. It's the, sort of the buzzword of the conference, I would say. Everyone has been really touching on it. Spark, I would say, is a zeitgeist. But within your organization, what were some of the indications on uh, uh, pain points or thresholds that you saw? So as we were going through some of our processes that we had currently worked on, um, we had seen ETL processes that were running exceedingly long, things that were taking over 24 hours to do, um, which was actually one of the reasons why we had done a pilot with you. And we wanted to see how we could transform those processes to make ourselves more efficient, that we could start looking at things more intraday rather than weekly mm. to, to perform better and be more efficient in our processes. Uh, within, within the Kellogg ar uh, 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 our analytics architecture, what's, what's sort of in your toolbox? So we have um, traditional user-based uh, information. We have a uh, traditional RDBMS that would be used um, normally or that has been in use for years. 
uh, we are adding a Hadoop stack, and we now have added MemSQL into our arsenal for our core services. Uh, in terms of just sort of the, uh, the Hadoop uh, uh, decision, what was sort of the driving factor as you sort of look beyond a you know, basic data warehouse? Hadoop is obviously something that is uh, uh, very useful, but when, when did Kellogg see the light around going with Hadoop? I think we saw the light when we, we had that understanding that data is really a commodity mm -hmm. and that it is an asset and that we have a tremendous amount of data throughout our, our enterprise and that we can really start to leverage that data to make ourselves smarter and more efficient about the things that we do both with our customers and our consumers and our shoppers. When you're looking at sort of the size and quantity of the data that you're working with, uh, what's been the impact on sort of your data management strategy? So much like every other company that's out there right now, we are seeing the effects of the amounts of data that we have so that we've established a data governance organization that is helping us get our hands around that massive amounts of data that we have to make sure that we're governing it in a way that is useful for everybody that we can kind of cut through the the chaff and the amount of noise that we're getting when we're starting to see the proliferation of data as it grows. Uh, is everything that you're running on-prem or is, are you now looking at cloud as well? So we run in a hybrid environment. Oh, interesting, okay. Can you describe sort of the, the uh, interest in going to hybrid cloud? So there are, there are certain things that, that we can and cannot um, put on and off-premise um, due to some of our contractual things with some of our suppliers. So, some things need to stay on premise and some things we are allowed to keep in the cloud. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I, I mean, shifting over to the BI side, what do you use uh, today to render everything back out to the business? So there are some of our traditional Microsoft Office stacks, but we do use Tableau for our visualizations. Um, one of the things that we saw when we did our pilot with you is that when we did direct connections to the database, we saw tremendous increase in visualization speeds, um, sometimes 20 times that when we did extracts directly into Tableau. Has this been rendered out to uh, the you know, catalog management yet? Do they actually want to see that this sort of thing as an app, or is this something that's still being sort of uh, uh, kept you know, on the, the analytics side of the house? So they, they have seen it as part of our analytics. Um, they have seen it rendered in our immersion room. They have seen uh, several applications run right off of it. Got it. In terms of uh, what your thoughts on IoT, I mean, is it a buzzword? Is it something that actually is impacting Kellogg? So I think it's starting to. I think IoT is starting to affect all of us, um, whether it be from wearables, um, whether it be from our sensors from our plants, or any other information that can be gathered, whether it be from your phone or clickstream data or any, any other information, any information that can be gathered through is, is affecting all of us. In terms of sort of you know sharing that data, uh, one of the big things that that has been always in my mind is concurrency. Uh, what are your thoughts on on sharing that data? It, because too, you can also have too much to share. Uh, and I guess what is the balance in your opinion between uh, uh, transparency and the concurrency to actually share that data? So I think it's a del so in my opinion it's a very very delicate line in which to walk. Right? I know that. Governance-wise, you, you have to be very, very careful as to what you do with the data that you have. Right? So that's why that you know, people implement a data governance organization in order to show what it is that they can use, what they can't use, who can see what information throughout your enterprise. And as you look in terms of evolving your, your current analytics infrastructure, what are the, the big things on your mind uh, as you sort of continue to add and improve sort of uh, your day-to-day -day analytics? So I think it's the, um, the change in processes is really what is big. So as more and more data comes into our analytics stack, it's how people can start to use that data cross-functionally to become smarter about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So that changes the paradigm as to who is looking at what, how they can be better about what they do in their day-to-day -day job, how they can get smarter, how everybody else can get smarter. Do you think that more folks within Kellogg are, are ex like expecting, uh, or, or rather uh, entitled to the, the fact of data access? Um, it, looking at sort of all these other trends around you know, BYOD and having your own ability to actually uh, 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 be as flexible as you need, how does that map into sort of an expectation that data should be shared? 
So I think it's, it, it couples with a good security policy. When you have a BYD, BYOD environment, you need to have an exceptional security policy that it goes along with that. Mm -hmm. That's why having a, a, CYS, a CISO that is very, very strong in setting down those policies to make sure that, that that data is very, very, very secure when your people are looking at it on your device is exceptionally important. Uh, Cal, when did you guys go BYOD? <clears throat> we are on that journey right now. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Going back on terms of, uh, of you know, just the next sort of phase of, of, of Kellogg, I mean, what are, what are some of the challenges that you anticipate that you want to be tackling over the next few years? So as we go to a more consistent Lambda architecture, as we start to do more real-time streaming, as we start to use the more streamliner architecture and bring more data into our environment, th those are the things that I think we would like to see tackled. Interesting. I mean, can you describe some of the use cases then, I mean, around logistics that you guys are, are focusing on? So um, like I was saying earlier, um, the pilot that we had done was more for our logistics services was we were doing a 24-hour ETL. We had converted a in-place POC that had grown well beyond our expectations. So we had 24-hour ETL that we needed to change. We wanted to make it faster. We had tried with another technology that was not as successful. So we turned to looking at your technology, which when your community edition came out, we downloaded your community edition. Within 10 minutes, we had it up, running, visualizations very, very quickly, which made us say, OK, how could this work with a larger <coughs> footprint? We built it up in AWS and then started putting our data there. Within two weeks, we had our ETL or ELT processes down to an average of 43 minutes. Then we added three years of archiving onto it, which we weren't able to do before, and still had it under 43 minutes. So we were able to consistently do our ELT processing with three years of archiving in a tremendous amount of time and efficiency gains. Then we threw our visualizations directly on top of it rather than doing extraction, which were allowing our people to be much more efficient in their day-to-day -day jobs with our case fill data. Interesting. What's your, what's your take on Spark? Uh, I think it's... Pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had a, uh, has it mapped pretty readily into uh, the Kellogg uh, uh, analyst uh, uh, team? I mean, it, it is using uh, Scala and Python. What have you seen as sort of, uh, you guys try to experiment with Spark in your environment? So we have not fully used it yet. We have started to touch on it. Um, we haven't really fully explored it yet. It's on our roadmap within the next six months or so to start really diving into it. I, I guess as a corollary question, I mean, why do you think that you're seeing uh, there's, such, there's such sort of interest in uh, main memory processing? So it's because of the, the need for speed that our business users are requesting. As things become more and more business oriented, there's no longer the ability to do projects because IT wants to do projects. Everything is business oriented. We have to be able to provide business value on each and every project that we do. And because every business user is requesting speed, is requesting the ability to move at a pace that is incredibly iterative, we need to be able to provide that to them. And memory allows us to do that. Uh, is that. Does that go back to sort of the entitlement of data access internally? Uh, it does. Um, it does in part. But having that ability to give them that speed to have our senior leadership teams be able to rifle through dashboards at lightning speed makes their jobs easier as well as our end users. Got it. Um, I mean, in terms of just your thoughts on, on, on uh, the big data ecosystem, uh, what have you seen over the past few years? I mean, you just basically went with Hadoop, as you mentioned. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on what your perspective is as a data scientist uh, and solutions architect at Kellogg. So uh, I think the first thing is, I, I think I would like to see the word big data just die. Um, it's data. Um, I think all of us that have worked in the data space for years, it's data. It's always been data. Um, I worked in telecom prior to, to Kellogg, and it's always been machine data, which is tremendous amounts. Um, Real-time data is always data. I think that we should just look at it as data. Whether we have the data in our hands or it is going to be passing into our storage, into our arrays, whatever it is, it's just data. Um, I think that as we mature in the Hadoop ecosystem when we start using 
um, Kafka as our message bus. We start using Spark. It's just going to, and we start using MemSQL. It's just going to start becoming more and more obvious how important data is and how we start leveraging it to make ourselves smarter. Interesting. I think that's really what is what's going to become more and more important. You, uh, you mentioned something interesting about flipping through those dashboards quickly. What, what is your current BI today at Kellogg? So we use, um, currently for our visualizations, so we use Tableau. Got it. Oh, and, and I mean, what progress are you making with Tableau at this point? Uh, we use Tableau globally. Globally, across, across the entire company. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And how many people actually can touch that analytic uh, via the BI? I can, it just goes back to that scale. It used to be limited. I imagine it's now uh, pretty big. So, it's, it's, it, so it depends upon the project or the subject. There are, our entire enterprise has a footprint in Tableau. In terms of just sort of what you're, what you're thinking on with Lambda, uh, what sort of spurred your, your exploration around uh, the Lambda architecture that you're seeing? So it, start, it starts with our um, understanding that in, we're going to start needing to be bringing more um, sensor information in from our plants um, than as you bring in clickstream data from our websites. Um, that's going to add to the and the architecture for the real time, then we already have the batch processing portion of it. In your opinion, real time, does it replace batch or, or is it something else entirely? I think they're still going to need to coexist in some way, um, but it would be nice to see batch really get small. Split, uh, the notion of taking batches to smaller batches to micro batches, I think it's it, smaller, smaller, smaller and smaller and smaller until it disappears. Yeah. Phenomenal. Well, uh, this was super help, uh, exciting for me to have you, you know, just to, uh, here today at, at Strata, uh, just to kind of hear your thoughts and what you've done uh, with big data or data, as it might be. Uh, and just to see that, you know, uh, I think the need for uh, 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 main memory processing with Kafka, Spark, and in-memory databases is manifesting across uh, a variety of verticals and industries. Um, so it was really helpful to, uh, to just hear your thoughts. I'd like to give uh, JR a round of applause. Thank you so much for coming over. Um, and if you have any questions on behalf, you know, you want to ask me, I'm happy to, to field them. We have a few minutes left. So <clears throat> I actually did have a couple questions <laughs> for it. So <clears throat> with the one-click Lambda architecture, how is Streamliner really going to help us get away to those micro batches? Mm -hmm. How is it going to push that down? So, so Streamliner is actually sort of a brand new, like, new direction for MemSQL. Uh, we've always built uh, a database system. And as we have seen sort of the industry go and evolve, I would say um, uh, Streamliner uh, is just sort of that first step in exploration. We started adding uh, Streamliner in, in version, uh, version four and a half. And it gives you this ability to actually build easily on top of Apache Spark. I think to your point earlier that Apache Spark is still very early. Uh, people are still trying to understand it. And what we wanted to do was basically uh, still deliver Spark and still deliver uh, uh, an ability to use Streamliner and streaming, but to do so in an encapsulated package. Um, and we also believe that it has to be open source to make it easily uh, uh, adaptable. Um, you can actually change anything within the Streamliner code base. It's on the GitHub account. And it's our belief that if you can make it easy to basically create a pipeline, um, you can start doing more advanced things once the data is just streaming in. Excellent. So now I know how it helped us and my team with our ability to speed up our visualizations. How do you think that you can help other people with more of their real-time BI and analytics? You know, the interesting thing with BI today is that it was always predicated on not touching the database. Uh, the notion of, like, I think uh, Tableau just made a, an acquisition called Hyper to so basically uh, continue to adapt their own main memory processing. A lot of BI tools will suck data out of a system and then cube it. And that creates, again, a, a difference between real time and not. Um, we want to continue to actually push the forefront of what's possible with just uh, real time BI. Uh, and that means pinging the database quickly. But uh, I think what we're seeing as well is an interest in WebSockets. The ability to actually just go direct to the system and render it however you need, I think it's creating a really interesting use case as well. So <clears throat> knowing that you are distributed, how do you feel that the, the flexibility of your deployments are going to continue to grow with MemSQL 5 and going forward? Well, I, I mean, I, I think the flexibility is really all about cloud. Uh, a lot of businesses are really pursuing that hybrid cloud strategy. 
And uh, if you don't have a database or system that is able to span that, it actually creates more uh, syncing issues, meaning that the data has to be manually uh, uh, ported. Uh, I think that uh, hybrid cloud is going to be a, like, probably one of the bigger uh, uh, sort of motifs and themes in the big data ecosystem over the next couple of years. Um, I think HDFS is sort of really solidified as you know, the definitive way to store lots and lots of data. And then it becomes a process of computing on it and uh, spanning uh, multiple data centers. Uh, we're all expecting to have multiple AZs and Amazon. And it's just my belief that hybrid cloud is going to be just a mega, mega trend in the next few years as well. Well, guys, I think we're at the top of our uh, session hour. I have one minute left. Thank you, Suji. If you guys have any questions whatsoever, I'm going to remain here until uh, noon or so before I grab lunch. I'd love to catch up with you guys. So thank you, and uh, thanks so much to JR. Thank you.